today I'm going to be taking you on a journey of thinking about your story and I'm going to be using principles from a book called Rising Strong. How many of you have heard about Brené Brown? Yeah? Yeah. So this is Brené Brown's book here, Rising Strong. And um, she is a professor and a researcher in America, and she spent about two decades studying courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy. And she's done a TED talk called The Power of Vulnerability, and it actually became one of the top five most viewed TED talks in the whole world. So it says a lot about the emotional needs of our society, doesn't it? I, I, I call her the Oprah of social research. <laughs> She's very engaging, very good to listen to. And she says that if we are brave enough, often enough, we will fall. And this is just the physics of vulnerability. It's like gravity, isn't it? You know, we all experience that. If we're human, we're going to fall. And there's a wonderful quote from um, the President Theodore Roosevelt that she refers back to, and it's called The Man in the Arena. And it says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who, and I should say herself, shouldn't I? Who spends herself in the worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if she fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that her place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Who's heard that quote? It's got a bit of oomph, doesn't it? I love it. And so from this quote, she derived that we all have what we call face-down moments. Who's had a face-down moment, if you get what I'm saying? I'm going to put both my hands up. So it's that moment of being in the arena and being marred with that sweat and that dust, you know, when we're trying and we're caring and we're doing our valiant best and we're falling down, and we're face down. This is what it looks like. <laughs> we're in the arena and we're face down. And um, I want you to think about a face down moment, and it might be big or it might be small. Um, we have face down moments every day. You know, we might get some feedback from our boss that was a little bit critical and we kind of go, ugh that really hurt, you know, and we feel like we're face down. Or it could be something huge, like we've had a divorce, we've lost a loved one. There are huge face down moments. And, um, you know, Brene Brown is a real advocate of vulnerability and I want to encourage you each and model this to you and share a little bit about my own story and my own face down struggle. Um, I'm, I was born and raised an Adventist. I was born in the San Hospital in Warunga, and I um, grew up in Warunga Church. Um, I'm from the Baldwin family. Some of you might go, ah, oh, I know so-and-so. Um, they're, they're quite a well-known family in the Adventist world, in Sydney at least. Um, yeah, my, my dad was one of the, he, he is the bold one in the family and he um, is part of a family who was a founding family of Castle Hill Adventist Church and they bought the land and donated it to the church on which the church was built and the school began and um, he was in the very first class at that school in Castle Hill Primary along with um, I think Greg's cousin Ken Long. So, yeah, so began the journey. I went to that school as well, so did my brother. I then went to Sydney Adventist College in Strathfield, um, went and did a gap year at Avondale, <laughs> and then went and did psychology at Macquarie Uni. That was my little 
out-of-bubble moment, um, to then come back. Um, I finished my psychology training in the government department, Department of Human Services, where I worked for five years, and then I, I came across to work for the church. But re rewinding a little bit, I you know, had this sense from the very beginning that ever since I was young, I was a real sort of go-getter, I was a real nerd at school, I was an overachiever, I was the school captain, um, prefect, you know, got the Ducks Awards and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I had my checklist laid out and I'm like, I know what my life's going to look like, right? And I'm ticking off the boxes, you know? I've done my psychology degree. Um, I even met a man who I had a crush on as a young kid back at um, summer camps, you know, Crosslands. Yeah. <laughs> I was 14 and I met a cool boy there and I had a crush on him and we met later at, Ke at my church, Kellyville Church. Um, and by the time I graduated uni, I was 23 um, and I got married and we had a kid in our first year of our marriage. And I'm just looking at my list going tick, 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 tick. My life is just going the way I want it to go, right? Um, I had my, and then I had my son in the sand, you know, coming full circle. And I, I don't know if you know, but there's now a wing in the sand named after my family because there were people in my family that worked at the sand as well. So, it's, and it's the maternity ward. <laughs> it's called the Baldwin Wing. So you can't get much more entrenched and you know um, institutionalized, I guess. So yeah, had my son. Started working as a psychologist and just thought. Life was going exactly how I wanted it to go. But as we've been talking about, you know, this weekend, life gets messy, doesn't it? And we get the rug pulled out from under us when we least expect it. So 2016, um, my husband was going away for work, two, two weeks away, two weeks home. He was away in Canberra. Um, and, and I'd say this was the catalyst, that this, there was an event that happened that was a catalyst that sort of led to this string of terrible events that happened for probably the next five years after that. Um, he was working in Canberra and he fell a great distance, 10 metres out of a tree. And he broke his back and his pelvis and several other parts of his body um, and went off to Canberra Hospital um, which at the time I didn't know, but my dad's sister, one of my dad's sisters, was in Canberra Hospital getting treated for end-stage terminal cancer. And she hadn't told us yet. So my husband ends up in the hospital in Canberra, in the exact same hospital. And um, we then embark on two months of travelling back and forth from Sydney to Canberra while well, I'm travelling with my son, um, you know, he was in the hospital getting multiple surgeries and rehabilitation and all of this kind of stuff. So we travelled back and forth and um, in the meantime we received the news that my auntie passed away. So had to then, yeah, go to a family funeral and, and all of that and I thought, gosh, this is such a bad year, you know. Could it get any worse? I said, God, what's next? And then, yeah, um, we got, got my husband home from the hospital and, and for the rest of the year it was just in and out of surgeries and rehabilitation and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and not more than probably two weeks after we got home, our dog died. And, you know, for, for those of you who, would, who are pet lovers, you would know how devastating that can be. So he was 13, he was quite old, and we actually had to put him down because he had some bad things going on. So... Yeah, we, we dealt with that grief and that tragedy just a couple of weeks after my husband gets home from hospital. The next thing was that his grandmother then goes into the hospital with, um, uh, what was it? Um, I forget the name of the organ, but yeah, there was a specific type of cancer and it was, again, terminal. And then we lose her. She passes away. And, you know, another family funeral, 
And I'm going, Lord, what is going on? This is awful. But at the same time as his grandmother going into hospital and, and dealing with the cancer, my dad goes into hospital. And my dad was someone who was very unwell all, all my life. Like he had chronic illnesses, he had Parkinson's, he had a heart disease and a whole lot of things going on. So dad's never really been a well man. Um, and at this stage, um, the three years prior to this, he'd gone into a nursing home and he'd started getting the dementia that comes along with Parkinson's. So at this stage, he was at a point of his life where he couldn't feed himself and he couldn't walk and he didn't remember who we were. So I'd actually been going through something we call anticipatory grief for a couple of years and my dad had forgotten who I was and I was grieving about that. So no, no sooner had we buried my husband's grandmother, my dad passes away. And this is a man that I was very, very close to. My dad was, you know, an amazing man in my life and taught me so much about values and integrity and work ethic. And, um, and he called me his princess. So needless to say, this was a devastating blow in my life, you know, at this stage. Um, and my mum was also unwell at the time. She has um, chronic uh, autoimmune disease, really rare kind of condition. So she couldn't handle dealing with the funeral. My brother has eight kids and lives out near Orange. So it fell on me. And I organised the funeral and did all of that. I think I was in shock. You know, I just organised the whole thing from start to finish and, um, and my husband comes along to the funeral, you know, he's on crutches and he has all this metal coming out of his pelvis and it was just unbelievable. Um, and, yeah, again, I said to God, what's going on? What next? And by that stage, I should have been very fearful of asking that question, <laughs> but I did. Um, and so, yeah, as we went on, we were, we were in some legal battles as well around my husband's work and, and the accident and all of that, and he'd lost his employment. And for five years after that, he didn't work at all. So I, I just kept soldiering on, kept working, never stopped, never really crumbled, never really allowed myself to grieve. And the following year, there was a series of events that happened where... I started learning some things about my husband. And I learned that he had not been living a life of integrity. And when he was going away to work and he wasn't with the family, there were all sorts of things going on. And I talked, I talked to my clients about the things in life that are deal breakers in relationships, addictions, affairs, and abuse. And I was experiencing all of those things and I didn't even know it. And let me tell you, ladies, wherever there is addiction and affairs, there's always abuse. There's deception, there's lying, and if someone is cheating on you, they're taking away your right for consent. You're not safe in that relationship. So I then stayed for two years, and we went through therapy, and we did support groups, and we did all of that. And he went into rehab, um, and I spent the last of my savings on rehab to get him the help that he needed. But it all became too much for him, and he ended up leaving me. And so now I've been divorced for 18 months, and I'm a single mother, working full-time. Um, and our son is now 16. He just turned 16 last month now has his learner license, so help me God. <laughs> but I became so afraid of saying, God, what next? Oh, uh, and I just felt like the rug kept getting pulled out from under me. And I, uh, when I stumbled and I came to and I stood up, the rug pulled, got pulled out from me again. And I kept falling down and I was just, I was face down for about five years. And, you know, I haven't had it all figured out. You know, I still feel like I'm in the middle of that and processing so much grief. But, you know, Brené Brown says that 
The brokenhearted are the bravest of all of us because they have dared to love and dared to care. And grief is just love that has nowhere to go. Um, Grief is something that we carry for the rest of our lives. So we will all struggle and fall and we all know what it means to be both brave and brokenhearted. So I'm going to take you on this journey today, the Rising Strong process. And ladies, we're figuring it out together, right? You know, um, our lives don't go the way we plan. They're messy. No matter how much we think we've got it in, under control. So I want to take you on this journey and um, please follow with me. And I want you to think about your own story as we do this. The first step is our reckoning. Now, do you know what the word reckoning means? Does anyone know? Just shout out. Accountability, taking stock, it's good. I like those answers, yep, yep, yeah. So anything else? Sorry, say that again. Coming to terms, coming to terms, yeah, I like that. There's actually quite a few different meanings for reckoning and, um, you know, we can look at it as though we're kind of, yeah, taking stock, we're kind of calculating or we're... Um, you know, looking at where we've come, you know, we're looking at the journey so far, kind of t- taking stock of that. I mean, the Aussie colloquial slang is, Oi, Davo, what do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, nah, I reckon, yeah. <laughs> so there's that meaning too. But um, so reckoning um, has to do with, yeah, taking stock. Like we're looking at the journey, we're mapping our course and we're saying, where are we? How are we going to know where we're going and how can we talk about our story if we don't know where we are? And it's about developing awareness. So there's this psychological theory called Johari's window and um, it's a way of understanding different levels of awareness. And I love the fact that, have a look at this first square there, it's called the arena, right? We're talking about the arena. The arena is where we're known to ourselves and we're known to others, right? We're not hiding, we're not keeping anything to ourselves. All the other parts, like the blind spot, the facade, the unknown, they're all different variations of either not knowing ourselves or others not knowing us, right? If the blind person guides a blind person, they'll both fall into a hole. (laughs) Wise words. And until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you'll call it fate. Have you ever heard that saying? It's by Carl Jung, one of of the psychoanalytic psychologists of the past. So we often are controlled by the things that we're not aware of, right? We get into these patterns and they can be toxic or we can have these hidden feelings that we just don't want to show anyone. And it can be a bit like holding a beach ball under the water. Um, and the pressure builds up, and you know how that feels? And, and the energy that we put into it to push it down, it doesn't work, at least not forever. And this happens, it bursts forth and it comes up. And this is what we call experiential avoidance. That's what we call it in psychology. And there's been a few experiments around this that are really interesting. So. One of them's called the white bear experiment, and there there were two groups of people who were asked to come into the experiment, and and one group was told, now, whatever you do for the next five minutes, you're not allowed to think about white bears. (laughs) And the other group was told, for the next five minutes, you can think about whatever you want, including white bears. And then they had to tally how many times they thought about white bears. So interestingly, the group that had to suppress it and push it down and not think about it thought about it way more. Isn't that interesting? So this is experiential avoidance. The the more we increase or try to attempt to avoid and, and escape our pain, we actually increase it. We increase our suffering through our attempts to avoid it. And Paul talks about this in Romans, right? The fact that 
there are these things underneath that if we just keep pushing them down, they come out in different ways and we keep doing what we don't want to do. It says, I, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. You know, we have these things that we push them down and if we don't understand them, we just get stuck in this toxic cycle and on and on it goes. If we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. Have you heard that saying? I like that one. It speaks to what we call the power of stepping away. It's things like generational trauma. You know, the grief that we don't process and the stuff that we don't deal with, we do pass it on. And we may not even realize it. We may not even want to. But that's the power of becoming aware and becoming vulnerable and dealing with it and stepping away. And dear Maya Angelou says, we do the best we can until we know better, then we do better. So today I'm going to be putting some more tools in your toolbox. And we're going to be begin to know better and we're going to learn how to do better. And we can't do that until we have the skills. So be gentle and compassionate on yourself as well. The first step, reckoning. Um, I, I like little sayings that, you, you know, help you remember things. And, um, you know, the three Ps of reckoning. These are the three skills that you're going to need to really face your story and, um, you know, become aware of it. And the first one is permission. Give yourself permission to be vulnerable, permission to feel those feelings and experience those really uncomfortable things. Number two is pay attention. We want to actually find ways to pay attention and notice it and, you know, the ways that it's impacting on our behaviour, the ways it's impacting on our relationships, how are we transmitting what we're going through. And then lastly, find ways to practise this. So it might look different for everyone, you know? A lot of people um, have heard that journaling's good, right? Uh, writing therapy is great. There's been research around that too, and they show that like just 15 to 20 minutes of writing therapy on four consecutive days actually significantly reduces depression and anxiety. So writing actually has a scientific basis to it. So some of you might practice doing this by writing, it might be therapy, it might be seeing a counsellor or a psychologist, or it might be talking to your friends and, and loved ones or people that you trust about it. But we need to reckon with our emotions, don't we? We need to practice getting uncomfortable and get curious. Curiosity did not kill the cat. <laughs> Curiosity is the key to becoming aware it's very, very important. So get curious about your feelings. You can't own your story if you don't really understand it first. And get curious about the story behind your feelings. What are you telling yourself when you feel that way? Because the reckoning is about knowing that you're emotionally hooked and getting curious about it. It's that simple, really, the first step. Get curious, give yourself permission to feel it, and pay attention and practice ways of getting in contact with those feelings. I, give, I try to give people the language of awareness. You know, these are skills that we don't necessarily naturally have already. Um, so it was interesting that, you know, Sylvia was talking about the, the I am and then the third word, right? And this has a lot to do with that. We often we often get tangled up in our feelings and we say things like, I am angry, I am anxious, I am all of this, right? So what I try to teach my clients to do is to try to uh, get a bit of distance from that. So we don't want to be all tangled up in our feelings, but we want to get a little bit of distance from it. So we firstly say, um, if we're saying I am angry, I then say, I feel angry. It's not that I am, I'm not that emotion, it's just an experience I'm having. And then we also then say, we step back even one more step, 
from it and say, I notice that I feel angry. So we're paying attention, we're noticing, we're tapping into that observing self and we're not just becoming, um, you know, our feelings and not knowing what to do with them. The hard thing about... um, you know, the hard thing about numbing our difficult feelings is about we, we can't just selectively numb things. We numb the darkness and the light. We numb the pain and the joy. So, um, you know, we find all these different ways of armouring up and becoming, you know, like being in denial about our feelings, don't we? And some of you might recognise, I should say armour, Um, Some of you might recognise these different ways that we armour up and we escape from our feelings. Um, We go over, under and around, don't we? The over is the over-functioning, it's the over-committing, it's the overworking. This was me, right? I was always trying to overachieve, you know, do the best I could because then I might feel good enough. And the story I was telling myself was... I am not good enough. I need to continue to achieve and work and do all of those things to prove it to myself and to others. Some of us go under the feelings. We shut down, we isolate, we avoid, we underfunction. We actually don't do what we know we're capable of doing and we become less than. And then the around is the numbing, the escaping, Um, the denying, and this can be dangerous. It can turn into things like addictions, you know, um, uh, alcohol, drugs, TV, food, shopping, you name it, right? But we know that the best way... Oh, hang on a sec, go back. We know that the best way out is always through, right? We have to go through. And this is what I love. Um, Brené Brown talks about the messy middle, which is what we have to go through. Um, And I love this quote. It says, scars are easier to talk about than they are to show. With all the remembered feelings laid bare and rarely do we see wounds that are in the process of healing. I'm not sure if it's because we feel too much shame to let anyone see a process as intimate as overcoming hurt, or it's because, um, if it's because even when we muster the courage to share our still incomplete healing, people reflexively look away, right? It's like, oh, that, that was a bit much. Did you have to do that? Did you have to show me that? You know, we don't know how to handle it. And when people reflexively look away, it's more to do with their discomfort than your pain. So we want to become a community that is um, comfortable with our messy middles and going through that. So, um, yeah, Brené Brown talks about that the irony is that we attempt to disown our difficult stories to appear more whole, but our wholeness Even our wholeheartedness actually depends on the integration of all of our experiences, including our failures. So that's the key, isn't it? Integration. So remember that, the permission, paying attention and practice, it's how we're gonna integrate our pain into our story. Are you ready to rumble? I won't do it. I'm not a rocky type, but, you know. Um, so we, we struggle with vulnerability, I think, um, in our church. Um, you know, we often see vulnerability as weakness. Um, we, just, we just don't do it that much. We often think, oh, I can do it. I can do it alone. It's fine. And we try everything. We try absolutely everything we can before we actually get vulnerable and let people know that we're struggling. I know I did this. You know, I learned to become very independent and it was only after I'd struggled through with my marriage for two years, you know, doing everything I could and all the therapy and all the stuff that I actually stopped and I prayed and I I realised I was... No, I had been praying the whole time, but I realised I'd been praying for the wrong thing and I was praying for God to save my marriage. But I said, you know what, God... I can't, like, I'm just so 
and so much grief and so much trauma, whatever your will is, I want that, you know? And two weeks later, we had separated for good and it was over. So, you know, we often try everything we can before we get vulnerable. Um, Yeah, and so what we need to tune into in the rumble is actually that story that's going on behind, you know, what what is it that we're telling ourselves or maybe what is it that you've been told by other people? Maybe you've been told negative things or received negative messages about yourself. And these thoughts impact on your feelings and they impact on your body and then they impact on your behaviour. And this is what we call the cognitive behavioural cycle. It's the core thing I do in my work. But um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to keep going. But um, we often tell ourselves really dangerous things like this, right? Dangerous things what Brené Brown calls dangerous conspiracies because they're not true, right? They're lies. I am a waste of space. I am worthless. I'm useless. I'm a failure. We tell ourselves these things and we get triggered into that in in lots of different ways. Brené Brown calls this the stormy first draft. So when we're writing our story, this is the first draft that comes up and it's not necessarily true. It's just what we're automatically telling ourselves. So this is your SFD. And, you know, part of what you can do is using the three Ps, you know, getting, getting curious about it, you can then evaluate these things for yourself. Like what are the emotions that are coming up? What's happening in my body? What are my thoughts and beliefs? What's the story I'm telling myself about this? And what are my actions? I don't know why that's so small. That's all right. So the language around that is, you know, saying to yourself, the story I'm making up about this is, and then getting curious about that. So we we have that kind of language. It's called the rumble language, you know. I'm wondering... I'm curious, the story I might be making up about that is. And so you see how we've entered into a totally different dialogue with ourselves and we're actually stepping back and we're noticing and I'm going, I wonder what's going on there rather than being all tangled up in it and not being able to deal with it. So we ask ourselves, you know, what more do I need to know about the situation about others and about myself. Because our brains are wired like this. So our brains are wired to make up stories. Do you know that? Our brains are meaning making machines. And wherever there are gaps in the information, we're going to make it up. Yeah. So, and your mind will do that from all of the information it's gathered along the way. That experience when you were younger, when someone told you, you talk too much you're a bit much, you're a bit loud, or that was not appropriate, you know, and we have all this stored in the back of our heads and that's where these stories come. So Brené Brown says, we need more people who are willing to demonstrate what it looks like to risk and endure failure, disappointment and regret. People willing to feel their own hurt instead of working it out on other people and people willing to own their stories, live their values, and keep showing up. Is that you? Are you the people who are going to do that? Because that brings us to the revolution, and this is the last step in the Rising Strong process. And, um, you know, revolution sounds like a bit of a dramatic word, doesn't it? (laughs) But... Um, Again, revolution um, in this world, and this is another quote of Brené Brown, she says, in this world, choosing authenticity and worthiness is an absolute act of resistance. This is our rising. This is our resistance. Choosing to live and love with our whole hearts is an act of defiance. (laughs) So you're all warriors in that revolution. And it's about becoming transformed. 
It's about using what we learn about ourselves and integrating that and creating change for ourselves, our families and our communities. You know, um, constructing ourselves. <laughs> We're under construction. And so rising strong after the fall is how we cultivate this wholeheartedness and this integrity and this integration. It's the process that teaches us the most about who we are. Um, and, and this is why God brings, well, he, whether he brings them into our lives or, or allows that, you know, it's all because of sin. But this is why these things that happen in our lives can really build our character, can help us to refine and know ourselves. So this is one of the last little tools that I'm going to give you today to put in your toolbox. And um, it's another acronym. I love these because, you know, it helps you to remember stuff, helps me to remember stuff. Um, and it's live big. So living big, which stands for boundaries, integrity and generosity, is saying, yes, I'm going to be generous in my assumptions and intentions while standing solidly in my integrity and being very clear about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So this is me learning from my experiences and saying, what do I then need to do to move forward um, and live in integrity? I don't want to go outside of my integrity because of what happened to me. But how do we do that? It's so hard sometimes. So boundaries, I mean, I could do another hour on boundaries. Are you okay with that? No. <laughs> I, I could do a whole workshop on boundaries. This is a whole other topic, right? Because um, I think we often struggle with boundaries. They're tricky. They're really hard. Um, not as simple as they sound, but it really is about getting clear on what is okay and not okay for you. Um, what if I said to you that, you know, bring, bring to mind someone who has hurt you, someone who maybe brings a lot of, chaos or pain or difficulty into your life, and I said to you, they're doing their absolute best. Do you believe that? <laughs> what do you think? You do. Great. Why do you believe that? Hmm. That's great. Yeah, so you, you're assuming, okay, they may be behaving like that because they're going through something. Yeah. Yeah. So making, making the most generous assumption about other people is actually saying, well, maybe they are doing their best. And this helps to inform us about what our boundaries are. So if someone is, um, okay, if someone's cheating on me, someone's lying to me and deceiving me, and they've done everything they can to try to overcome that and they're not changing it, and I keep saying, no, you can change. I believe in you. You can do better, right? And I stick at it. Is that going to be healthy for me? No. So what if I said, this person is doing the best they can and the best they can is actually harmful to me? Then I'm going to say, it's not okay. I'm not okay with that behaviour. I need to do what I can to stay in my integrity and get out of that. So that's how we use that. It's not a fluffy, you know, oh, everyone's trying their best. Oh, it's okay, you crashed into my car, you were just trying your best, you know, don't worry about it. No, no, it's, uh, that wasn't okay, you know, um, and I'm going to show you grace, but if you show me your best and it's, it's harmful, then I need, to, I need to learn from that and I need to protect myself. So, yeah. Um, and the integrity part is how we set the boundaries and hold other people accountable to that. So it's important that we know our values, we know what we stand for. And then lastly, you know, that generosity, that part comes into it because otherwise we don't know um, where to set the boundary. Yeah, so our dear Brené Brown says, integrity is choosing courage over comfort, choosing what is right over what is fun, fast or easy and choosing to practice our values rather than simply professing them. So in rising together, I want you to think about your network of support and who are the people in your life 
that you can, you know, be vulnerable with and practice this process with? Who's there to support you? Because we rise together, right? And the people that you write down should fit on a post-it note, okay? We don't have 50 people in our lives that are really close and that we can be vulnerable with. Um, I mean, I got the chance to be vulnerable with like 150 people, but it doesn't work like that, right? So we need to have our... Um, and, and I do this with the kids at school. I work in a school as a counsellor as well. So we have our trust hand, and it, it's five people at the most, right? And we say, well, let's write down the people on that hand that you know you can go to about anything and that you can trust them and they're safe people. And so for you, that should fit on a post-it note or fit on your hand. All right. So as you become brave... I want you to have the courage to get in the arena. I want you to have the curiosity about your feelings. And I want you to be comfortless in the face of dis discomfort. You know, we need to sit through the discomfort, go through the messy middle, embrace it. Because owning our story can be very hard, but not as nearly as difficult as spending our lives running from it. Embracing our vulnerabilities is risky, but not nearly as dangerous as giving up on love and belonging and joy, you know, numbing them out and pushing them out. The experiences that make us the most vulnerable. Only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. And this is where we also discover the, the light of God, you know, and how he is using our story um, as a bridge to reach other people. And I know that my brokenness is a better bridge than my pretend wholeness ever was. You know, pretending to have it all together and my checklist and, you know, my nice little life. But there's been way more opportunity to shine that light for God through the brokenness. And God promises us, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Um, my, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So as a very last disclaimer for you, if any of you are going through any trauma or mental illness, um, today may have touched a nerve for you. Um, if something sensitive has come up, I really encourage you to reach out for help. And sometimes that includes professional help. Um, we can't always do the rising strong process on our own. Um, very rarely can we do it on our own. So I really encourage you that, yeah, if there are complicated things going on in your life, please reach out. Um, it's a helpful process, but sometimes it's not enough. So if anybody does want to reach out to me, um, I work in the Adventist Counselling Services in Sydney, and this is my email address. Um, and I'd love to hear from you. But thank you so much for letting me take you on this journey today. And um, is it okay if I pray over you as we finish? Let's do that. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for um, the life that you have given us and the grace that you show us and that you were the ultimate example to us of how to live this life. Um, thank you for giving us each a story that we can share um, we know that you are working through that and we just ask your Holy Spirit to be with each and every one of these wonderful ladies as they continue on their journey and that, and that you write the ending for that story. We ask this in your name. Amen.